Are you ready? Stand by. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. I'm your host, Dave Hartman. This week, I'm taking a little break, but I wanted to leave you with some good content to get you fired up to shoot this weekend. So I dug into the archives way back to August of 2015, and an interview with the incredibly hardworking and talented Jerry Michalek. The reason that I chose this one is I've had a lot of conversations about vision in shooting recently, both both on and off the air. Uh, so I thought it was a good time to revisit This podcast with Jerry was the first time that I heard the concept in detail, and it not only blew my mind, but it changed the way that I think about the game as well. If you haven't listened to it already, I know that you're going to like it, and if you have, listen closely to see what speaks to you this time around after having more experience in the game. As a special bonus, I've added a little behind-the-scenes banter between our buddy Adam Maxwell and I after the interview from uh, some recording that we did this summer. And finally, before we get started here, as you know, Armalite is giving special discounts to the Three Gun Show listeners on their line of Three Gun rifles and parts. With the end of the year coming up soon, now is the time to make the decision if you've been sitting on the fence, especially if you're in Colorado. Seriously, Coloradans, hit me up soon if you want one. Dave at threegunshow.com. Just email me and uh, we can go from there. And if you haven't figured out yet the reason that I don't mention pricing on the show, is that it is lower than you can get anywhere. I'll be back with a new show next week, but until then, enjoy this one for the Three Gun Show Archives with Jerry Michalek. All right, so we're here at Rocky Mountain Three Gun, and I've tracked down the the man, the myth, the legend, Jerry Michalek. Got to sh- see him shoot a stage today, and uh, it was quite fast, which, as usual, and uh, managed to bring Jerry back to his own abode here in the competi- competition headquarters or the, uh, the the shooter's accommodations at uh, at the Whitting- Whittington Center here at NRA. And uh, Jerry, I want to thank you for joining me on the Three Gun Show. My pleasure, Dave. It's good to good to be here. All good right. To be here. Well, Always. this should be uh, this should be a good time. We're sitting in the middle of a kitchen, and uh, hopefully, no one <laughs> needs to cook anything while we're we're doing this. But uh, we got a barbecue coming up here, so that should be uh, on everyone's mind. So, Jerry, curious. Uh, um, want to take it like all the way back? I got like a thousand questions for you, but uh, okay. But basically, want to to Give us an idea of like who you are when you're not shooting, who you are off the range. What do you do in your spare time? Well, I'm a I'm a tinkerer. I gotta always be doing something. So uh, we have a 150 acre range back home, so that keeps me pretty busy. I'm the guy that cuts the grass, takes out the trash, works on the equipment. So I, I maintain all my own equipment, and uh, I come from a mechanic background. I was a millwright for 16 years, so certified welder and hig mig tig and do all that stuff. So. I was a multi-craft mechanic, uh, so I just enjoy doing things. If you don't see me on the range, I'm working on guns, working on equipment, tuning up a lawnmower, or just uh, I'm a hands-on kind of guy, you know. Just got to be doing something. Nice. It's like the the mechanical part of it. I, I do. Hear, I, I do hear like, that from a lot of guys. I like the aspect of that, yep. So were, were you like into cars growing up and things Oh, yeah. Like that? We built, had a Ford Bronco. I built it, topped it, you know, uh, back in uh, 1974. I had, uh, matter of fact, I bought an old Bronco. I had a had to cut it in half and buy another half and and uh and uh weld it together and put it on a chassis and built all the differentials and stuff transmission and uh used to go run the mud with it and have fun wow yeah you built that one the hard way it was i I welded it together with coat hangers i took (laughs) my mom liked to run me out the house i used up all the coat hangers welding that thing together but uh it came out all right (laughs) that's awesome so was that like stick welding i didn't know you could weld a coat well you just you just use acetylene acetylene oh okay yeah so and that held together. Oh yeah, came out beautiful. Nice. Yeah, you can do a lot of stuff with with the, with the coat hanger. Built a few airboats with coat with coat hangers and conduit. So, wow, works out pretty good. Sweet. So if my truck breaks down on the way, <laughs> oh yeah, home, we I got can some we can, got some bailing wire and we can <laughs> get it going. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, where, when uh when abouts did it take a turn to shooting for you then? Well, I was always interested in hunting, and being from South Louisiana, we were fortunate to have a lot of good hunting in the area. The bad thing about it, when hunting season was over, you put the gun in the closet. So uh, the idea was to try to shoot all year. So we we got introduced into competition shooting. I, I met an old boy from uh, Arizona by the name of Ben Ashmore in 1976. 
he was a contractor working some of the chemical plants along the river there where I grew up in South Louisiana. And uh, he had a Swenson 45. Have you, heard, have you ever heard of Swenson? I never have, no. He was the, one of the top pistol smiths back in the day. Okay. And he was working out of a leather host. He had magazines. He was doing mag, mag changes and stuff. And they, back then they called it uh, combat shooting. Right. So when I saw him, he was at a local dump, which where everybody shot. You know, when we was kids, you go to the dump, shoot stuff. He was there, and he had some steel targets on a stick, and he was drawing out of a holster shooting these targets with a Swenson 45. And it was just like, man, this is pretty trick. Yeah. Really nice guy. And he was in the area for a couple of months doing some electrical contract work and got to, got to know him real good. And he was doing some little competitions at the sheriff's department. So I, it was 1976 when I first shot my uh, first uh, competition. So it was kind of fun. Well, that's cool. So what did they call the uh, competitions back then? Was that USPSA? No, it was before uh, USPSA. Okay. So it was just so, like a yeah, just, unorganized type they thing? They just called it a little combat match. Oh, that's they, pretty cool. They called cool. it a combat match. You, you had stopwatches. Yeah. And you had two two pieces of aluminum you hit together, and you started the clocks, and you had always had a stop target. And you had two guys running a stopwatch, and they would stop them, and you compare the times and average it and write it down. So we didn't have timers. Uh, that was before they had electronic timers. Right. So it was kind of early on in the game, and before USPSA was actually established, 76. So how long did you shoot those matches then? We shot those for a couple of years, and then we started doing our own. Uh, mm-hmm. Ben went on his on his way doing his contract work, and uh, we started doing matches uh, ourselves in Thibodeau, Louisiana, about 1980. I think we started our first one. We had the Cane Break Combat Shooters was our club, and we shot those matches up until about 85. And then there were more uh, handgun matches starting, USPSA and a second chance bowling pins. You ever heard of second chance? I have. We started, My first second chance match was 1982, and I shot them all the way up until the last year. I think it was 98 or 99, so I shot about 20 years up there. And what was really nice about second chance, you could win guns. So our first year up there, we went up by Amtrak train. It was kind of, kind of, it was, <laughs> this is, this is tell you how, how it went, how it went. I had a backpack. I know a GI backpack that weighed about 90 pounds. It was full of guns. I had two ammo cans in each hand, put brown paper around them, uh-huh. get on a train, got off in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We went shooting, my buddy and I, and hell, I think I won six guns that year. Six guns, wow. We had a Python and a couple of 29s, a couple of HK 91s. We stuck it all in backpacks and uh, <laughs> got back on, <laughs> got train back on the train and came back home, you know. So That's it was awesome. kind of fun, and we, and we realized you could actually – do some fun stuff and win guns. So uh, we started hitting second chance pretty hard. That's cool. So now in those early days, did uh, did you practice a lot, or do you feel like you had like some natural ability? Well, it was just the opposite. I had no ability. Oh, okay. So, so the, the interest was the, to always to get better. Uh, so I put a lot of hours into it. Yeah, and what kind of practice did you do? A lot of revolver shooting. The revolver aspect of the game would, was what uh, – Really had my motivation and uh, tried to be the fastest revolver shooter in the world. That's what I wanted to do, you know. So I pursued that and went on. And with, when I hired on with Smith and Wesson, I actually established that fact. Right. So I've got I have five NRA sanctioned uh, world record shooting revolvers. So and they're all NRA certified, which is really different than most size guys who say they have a record. Right. So the NRA actually has a person that you can hire out, and he'll come out and certify your your attempt. No kidding. Yeah, he comes out and looks at the watches and what you're doing, and he write it off. And uh, so these are actually all certified and NRA sanctioned uh, uh, world records. So what does that world record entail? Like what? What well, is I, the? Uh, is it like a competition or is it? Just no, like a, this was just speed shooting. One of them was okay. how many? Uh, five rounds on target in uh, 57 one hundredths of a second, and then eight, wow. eight, eight shots in one second with a revolver. And then I did a speed load drill, uh, shoot six and reload in two not two point ninety nine one hundredths. Jeez. Then we did five guns. I mean, I'm sorry, it was it was ten revolvers in a in a in a row on a table. First one in your hand when you shot your 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 last shot. I had a seventeen point twelve seconds. I put sixty rounds on target in seventeen seconds. <laughs> oh my god! So I averaged twenty seven hundredths of a second for ten guns. That's incredible. So it was kind of fun. That was something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Well, that's pretty so. sweet. So you set your eyes on becoming the best revolver shooter yeah. out there, and now you've got like the paper that says that you. Yeah, that you it are. was fun. It's, it was a, it was a good race. So won a bunch of uh, nationals and the steel challenge, and just uh, so I kind of got into the three gun real heavy. Uh huh. So I hadn't really shot much revolver since then. Last couple of years, 
But the three gun, we we started off with Soldier of Fortune in, in the 80s. I think my first Soldier of Fortune three gun was 85. Okay. Oh, maybe a little bit, a little bit earlier. There was only three gun match in the United States. Oh, okay. It and paid paid ten grand for the winner. That's pretty good, even on today's standards. Like, you know, so in 1985, ten grand was a lot. It of is. Money. So in a shooting game, that was big money. I I didn't do much good at at the few uh, uh, first couple of them. I I did manage to come in second place with a revolver one year, and I was out out of first place like thirteen hundredths of a second. Oh wow. So I almost won Soldier Fortune with a revolver. I mean, folks can say that. So <laughs> that'd have been incredible. But I actually won the SOF competition three times, but I had to go to a pistol to do it. But uh, so that three gun kind of started. Then USPSA started doing three gun matches. Mm-hmm. So for the, for those first uh, Soldier Fortune matches, you yep. mentioned that you shot a revolver. Yep. And then you switched to a pistol. What what did your gear setup kind of look like then? Give us an idea of uh, what the we're the pistols. With. A pistol, the rifle, and the shotgun. Okay, back in the early days, like back in the early days, yeah, you could only use like a stock configuration on the rifle. Okay. So the only optic that was legal is if you shot a shot a Steyr Arg, which oh, okay. had the optics built into the handle. Yeah. That was kind of a trick setup. So I, I shot a gold uh, a Colt, uh, gold cup, just pretty much out of the box with with metallic sights, and the shotgun. I had some Remington 1100s, I think, back then, and the pistol was a uh, STI. High capacity pistol, forty caliber. So you had to have major then, and uh, it kind of progressed from there. And it got more and more gamer like. Yeah, you had to game it. You know, uh, the evolution of the of the sport. You know, things change, guns change, techniques change. Yeah. So. Well, it's like anything you put men in comp or women in competition, right? And uh, and they'll find you know the the next little the little next, bit that's going to get them that the edge next in the gizmo. Match. That's right. <laughs> next gizmo, the next technique and stuff yep. like that. Yep. As so you mentioned, the last few years you've been getting into it real heavy. Yeah. And uh, so what what made that swing into like, well, I'm going to commit all my time to three gun now? Well, you know, a uh, professional shooter, if you shoot really hard and, and a lot, I've been, well, Smith & Wesson hired me out professionally in 1990. So I've got like 25 years behind a double action trigger. So I've probably shot a million and a half rounds or so, two million rounds. Wow. So it gets to a point to where you, you're you going to start tearing your hands up. So I figured I'd throttle back on the handguns and start shooting other stuff, other other firearms to prolong my competitive line. Okay. You know, so that's one of those you could really to stay that hot on a revolver for all those years is a lot of work. It's a yeah. lot of it's a lot of fire. Uh, you know, sixty eighty thousand rounds a year, and it just it gets hard on your hands. Uh, so so I'm just trying to throttle back on that. I'm still shooting a lot of pistol, but nowhere near the level. So I'm taking in the shotgun more and then the rifle, of course. To help uh, ease the uh, the burden on the hands. Mm-hmm. So. so, so you shoot open. Is that yes. Right? Yep. What what drew you to open? What made you decide that's going to be the uh, the well, division the, I shoot in? The vision part. Okay. When you, when you get to be sixty years old, that's what happens when you shoot a metallic handgun, a metallic sighted handgun. You have to have a correction to see the sight, and then a correction on your left eye. I'm right eye dominant, so that correction is for the front sight, mm-hmm. and the left eye is for the target. Okay. So what happens is if you close your left eye, the target will blur completely out. Right. So when you go from a, and it makes it makes everything harder when you get the the clarity of the uh, the target. You and just the transition times as your eyes age, get slower, and then you don't see the target as sharp. So it really gets to be a burden on the shooter. So you have to find ways to stay competitive in the game. So the optics part really helps an old guy like me stay competitive. Yeah. So. That's what I have to do, you know, to stay competitive. So I've heard that from, you know, quite a few shooters that mm. shoot in open. And I have to say that, like, when I when I look at, like, open shooters at mm. the, the matches I go to, yep. generally there's a demographic, right? Yeah, it is, yep. Are, are you, do you ever consider, like, if, uh, you know, someone like 19, 20 years old shooting open, their entire career comes in, you know, at age mm. 30, they're just going to smoke it? I mean, yeah, it it's, it's destined, like... you know, it, it's, uh, they just have the lung capacity and everything else to go with it, you know? Right. So I'm just trying to hang on as long, as long as I can. If you look at the bullseye game, back when my father-in-law, Jim Clark, was shooting bullseye, uh, when you got in your fifties, that was about it. Uh, you just couldn't see good enough. Right. No matter what you did with your corrections, you just, uh, and the optics in the bullseye games have really extended the life of a bullseye competitor, you know, cause these guys had to shoot like 26 eighties, you know, to stay competitive. And with the optics, you can do that nowadays, even though you're 50 and 60 years old. So it really helped in that game. It's helping in my game for me to be here. Really, I shouldn't be here shooting against these guys. These guys could pick me up and 
and run with me faster than I can <laughs> run, you know. So I'm just here to have fun and, and just aggravate them as much as I can. So, Well, it, it's, <laughs> it's great, though, because you say that, but every time I hear one of these guys talk, you know, they're like, well, you know, then there's Jerry you got to think about. So it's good that you're putting the fear of God into the uh, the youngins still, you know. And I want to insult them a little bit, let the old man run them over, you know. I hate, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it keeps you it keeps you active yeah you ever poke them at the end like hey i got 30 years on you i got 40 years on you i'll let them i'll let them worry about that <laughs> <laughs> well that's awesome so so let's talk about your your gear setup a little bit you know i okay. i can tell by you know sitting here staring yep. at you that you've uh you've got a lot of uh good sponsors that are helping you out you mentioned yep. uh smith and wesson yep and i uh, saw you shooting an m&p Yep. And uh, so let's talk, let's start off with that pistol. What's the it's, uh, setup it's, like on it? Okay, it's an M&P core, which means it's a 5-inch, so it's a long slide. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's magnaported. It's been quadruported by magnaport. And I've got a uh, an optic on the slide. Of course, the old man, you know, gig there, you know, got to have see what you're missing. It's got a magwell and a tungsten guide rod, just about everything you can do with it. I just take the factory trigger parts and modify them and run it that way. So it's probably got a little bit under 3-pound trigger. Got a uh, extension on the magazine, so they hold 26 rounds, so the 170 millimeter magazine. I do have to say though that that M&P magazine is probably the most trouble-free magazine I've ever run in my life. Oh, really? Yeah, on any kind of double stack. I've had the same springs in there for about six years. Oh, wow. Yeah, just like uh, just put in the sonic cleaner, maybe once in a while, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> same follower, same everything. Just shoot it. So the gun really functions good. Uh, a slide mounted optic. I would rather have a frame mounted optic, maybe a little bit bigger, but uh, that's not going to happen. So I just have to live with what I have. And the rifle is at a Smith and Wesson uh, Performance Center. Of course, I. But one thing about an AR, you can tweak it a zillion different ways. Yeah, and then so. Some. Of course, it has my compensator on it, and it has a Vortex one by six scope on it. And I have a Vortex uh, red dot on the side. You know, you can shoot you can shoot two optics and open, so that works really good. Has an American gold trigger in it. Uh, the other little pieces and parts, you know, make it make it what it is. It's an extremely accurate gun. That's one of my best ones I've ever had right there. So it's my match gun. I only shoot it when I need to shoot it. It's play, when you need long range accuracy. So I kind of baby that one. And the shotgun is a uh, is a Mossberg. It's a JM 930. It's a gas gun. Uh, they've sponsored me with with Mossberg now for about four or five years. And that's one of my original guns that I had gotten from them. So it's got a lot of hours on it. I turned it into an open gun. Yeah. So it's got a 16 round extension on it, and a load and shoot for the uh, for the for the speed loaders, and an optic on on the top, and it's magnaported. Uh, magnaported work. Uh, magnaport was kind enough to work with with me on a porting that I like, mm-hmm. and they tailored it to exactly the way I wanted it. So uh, it shoots about as fast as I can uh, as I can make it happen. So. One thing, I, one thing about the Mossberg guns, they're they're really fast. You can get down 12, 1,200 splits with them if you can stand up on it, you know. Wow. So it'll sing a song if you can. If you're mad enough to hump it, it'll <laughs> it'll it'll sing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, so the uh, the Mossberg when when those first came out, like the JM 930s. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing like pictures of you with yours, you know, huge extension on it, and you had like this compensator it looked like it yeah. belonged like on a Barrett. Yes. Is that what we're talking about still, or have well, you changed the, that setup? That barrel was one that they had marketed it uh, for, I don't know exactly what uh, market it was, but it was a Barrett-style aluminum brake on the front. It didn't have a choke in it. Hmm. I actually shot those in competitions for a couple of years. I liked the way it shot. It shot really good. The only disadvantage of it, the choke was way inside of that compensator, and you had to use an extension to get to it. So I kind of weaned myself off of that, and it, it was just too hard to change chokes fast. Yeah. So I just went with a regular conventional barrel and uh, had it magnaported, and it works just as good. So, but there is something to say about a compensator closer to the bore. I mean, closer to the chamber, you get more gas in it. Right. So you had it. It worked really good. I just uh, didn't like the idea of messing with the chokes. I had, you know, you had to, it just. Well, for this too, game too, too when we're changing consuming. chokes so often. Yep. You know, based on like right. the uh, the stages that we're going to. Yep. Hey, yeah, I totally hear you. It makes more sense on that. So then, how about your uh, your belt setup? I saw you, you know, running around with like some looks like a yeah, Indian some, arrows type type thing. Yeah, so Farland <laughs> makes the, that uh, that loading uh, uh, apparatus. I guess you'd have to call it for the uh, for the uh, for the speed sticks, and they hold five five tubes. Some matches you have to put uh, two of them on. We need ten tubes, 
there's going to be a stage here where I'll have to, well, I'll have I'll have ten of them on me and uh, probably some ammo in my pocket. Well, <laughs> I think it's a forty round stage here, so they're going to hold seventeen. And uh, the idea you got to try to keep it hot, keep a lot of ammo in it. When these aerial targets come out, you know they're ten points apiece plus a failure to engage penalty. So you always got to have bullets in the thing to make it happen. So. A lot of ammo on you on your person is a good thing. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, especially on a forty round stage. Yep. So it seems like uh, you know, there's there's always like uh someone out trying to or you know, match records trying to outdo each other, getting more and more right. shotgun yep. uh, rounds on a stage. Yep. Where where do you think that sweet spot is? I would say in the thirties is way enough. Uh what happens is it, it it's so much space on your body. I think about my daughter when she shoots, she's kind of a small person, she doesn't have a big waist. Mm-hmm. So you kind of a disadvantage of how much ammo you can hang on your person. You get a big guy, you know, he's got a forty-seven inch waist. You can put two, three, <laughs> yeah. two or three boxes of shells up there, you know. <laughs> so th- there's a point of no return on 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 everything. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the shotgun matches, well, it is now. It, it's turned into a whoa. Hey, it's getting close. It's I'm glad I'm inside. Out there. I'm glad it's uh. Oh, say, I'm glad I'm inside. Yeah, no but kidding. But on the shotgun matches now, it's, it's really gotten, it's really to the point to where speed loading is, is, is everything. So, and it's so much loading going on. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of practice to stay current with that. And it's, 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 it's evolving too. It's, it used to be everybody was loading single and they started yep. loading doubles. Now there's quad loading. And I'm waiting for somebody to come up with six of them at a time, but yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it yet. But uh, my hands are not big <laughs> enough for that. I mean, I yeah. I fumble the quad loads all the time. So it's pretty interesting how things evolve, and it's really quick. Yeah, for game. sure. So it's you know I watched a lot of shotgun uh, stages and a lot of good people loading today, and and it was you know it's it is pretty incredible. But you know you're right when you talk about like the smaller shooters, right? Especially the ladies, like you watch them doing like two rows, so they've got right. like a chest rig. Yep. And belt set up, and just absolutely everything is is uh, covered run, for that. They, they run out of real estate real quick. Yeah, for so sure. It's uh, it's harder on the smaller people. So, but, have you tried the uh, quad load at all? Yeah, I have. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm, want the uh, sticks? Well, it's I'm not as good with it. Uh, I have to load with my weak hand. Okay. Uh, my hands a little large to do it with strong hand. That's another thing. The bigger your hands are, the harder it is to get around the ammo in these holders. And the wider your hand, is, it's just... Uh, oh, yeah, the, for, like, getting your finger between the right, shell the, and the, the holder. smaller okay. hands fit the loaders better. And uh, my daughter shoots, she's, she quite loads like she's on fire. And her hand is just the right size. Well, her... Let me see, my, uh, <laughs> my little finger is as big as a thumb. <laughs> right. You know, so that's the, that's the dis- differences, you know, between the size of the hands. So when she grabs out of those pouches, she's got a lot of room. When I grab, I can't hardly get my hands in between the shells. And then when I want to handle them quick, it's just uh, all that hand gets in the way. So you don't shoot shotgun with Lena because she's smoky on it? Yeah, she will smoke me really <laughs> bad. So <laughs> Really bad. <laughs> yeah, she she had a pull up. She shot the uh, last championship there, the uh, one at Rock House, and came in third overall. Really? Yeah. That's, a, that's fantastic. Overall. So there's no way I'm going to get on the line next to her. So I'll, I'll stick in my <laughs> open division go hide somewhere in the corner. Nice. <laughs> Let her have her day, and yep. you'll do the opening. Yeah, they're getting ready to go to the World Championships in Italy, so they're they're working at it really hard. So she's got a title to defend, right? Yep, that was her first world title last, uh, I guess, two years ago now. So she's pretty stoked up and ready and, and ready to fly. So yeah, well, the look on your face looks like you're stoked up too about it. Yeah, she's do she does good. You know what's what's amazing was when I when I started when she started really shooting competitive, uh, I could tell her things. And she could pick it up and see exactly the way I see. And I've trained a bunch of folks through the years, and uh, she's about, she's the only one I could tell something like that visual. And this game is such a visual performance. A lot of people think it's very physical or it's very technical. It's, it's not. It's a vision game. That those who see the fastest are going to always execute the fastest. And I can explain a vision technique that might have taken me 15 years to see and duplicate on command. Like when I do a Smith & Wesson demo or a performance in front of a crowd, mm-hmm. if you don't have your visual clues in order before you attempt that stunt, it's not going to happen. And I could tell her, and she could pick it up in just a few minutes. And uh, it, was just, uh, it was stunning to me that she could, she could, she could pick that up. So, so give me an example of like those type of visual cues that you're talking about. Soft focus, 
lot of people don't know how to soft focus on targets and the gun gets in the way. That's, okay. a, that's a very basic problem. They're looking at the target so hard, next thing you know, that gun gets in the way. Well, where, where did this thing come from? Well, you should have seen it way before it got under your dominant eye. You know, seeing more than one target at a time. Being able to see more than maybe three targets at a time. Interact, you know, uh, your field of view is always what I'm working on when I'm, when I'm trying to shoot. And when I do my drills, I, I want to have a huge field of view because the more you see, the more you can interact with. Uh, uh, looking, know, Knowing where to look and how much to look. You can stare something to death and you don't really need it. If you've got a target five feet away, it doesn't take much skill to get that front sight in the middle of this brown piece of paper and put two shots in it. Right. You know, so knowing how to look soft and keep the gun in focus when it was not the full extension or division skills. It's just hard to explain, but it's uh, it's everything in this game. If you watch the guys who really shoot fast, they, they know how to see fast. Do you have any sort of like uh, drills or or uh, practice that you do for your, your vision to keep you in uh, in good shape? I'm always working. And the older my eyes get, the harder it is. Uh, they don't focus as fast as what they used to. So I have to really be keen on understanding what I need to see before I pull that gun out of the holster mm-hmm. and how I'm going to see in between targets. Uh, like, if you've got a target six foot apart, am I going to ride the red dot into the target, or I'm going to leave the gun, find the target, then bring the gun back in and, where well, I'm going to pick the dot back up coming into the target. Little things like that. Mm-hmm. If you have a 12-target scenario, you save tenth of a second times 12 is 1.2 seconds. You know, so it's all the little stuff always adds up. So if you look at the guy shooting very, very, what we use, what we might want to say is fast, but it's very smooth. Right. And it looks like they're not doing anything special but because they're not wasting any time. All, all they are trying to do is use that time that's just going to benefit them. So take all the trash out and just shoot it, shoot it steady. So how do you then decide if you're going to be riding that dot between targets or if you're going to be looking to the next target? But it's, it also has to do with the level of the shooter. Uh huh. You know, you just can't tell somebody to do this. If I went into a, a secretary's office and she's typing and she's looking at me and she's doing 60 words, you know, a second or something, I'm in a minute, you know, and she's looking at me and she's still typing. It took her 10 years of experience on those keys to get to that. So she could tell me, yeah, look at me in the eye and type. It's going to take me 10 years to see that. Ah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can you can express it verbally, but you have to put the hours in to actually see it. But what you have to also do is learn how to catalog an event and, and put a value to it. So if you had a good visual moment on the range, you ought to be able to feed off of it and be able to come back to it. As a professional, you have to be able to have vision tier skills that you can come in and out of. So then when... One of those events, like you were talking about, right. happens on the range. Right. Then you have to be cognizant of it, hold on to that moment. Yep. And then catalog it for future use. Yep, definitely. Yeah, it's hard. It's a lot of guys that have a stunning run, and they'll turn around and say, man, I burned it, and then they can't repeat it. Yeah. You know, that moment's gone. And the reason is they didn't understand what they were seeing. So when you get enough hours in, you actually start to understand what visual clues are important and when when you need to, to apply them. And that's just hours and hours of – uh of repetition, but it's also being able to look for these clues as you progress through your training. I call it I call it having a moment. Right. You have a moment on the range. Sometimes I even stop and go home. I'm shooting on a range. I have a, a beautiful visual moment. I'll just go back to the house. That's it for the day. Just feed off of it and come back and try to pick it up again cold. There's cold runs and there are hot runs. If I've shot 100 rounds, well, I'm going to be pretty good. You're not going to have that advantage when you get on the line and they say, let's go. Yeah. So that, to understand the difference on that means a lot to the shooter on his on his cold performances. Yeah, so that that is one thing that that I struggle with in in my own three gun shooting mm-hmm. as well is uh, getting out there and performing right off the bat. Yep. When in my practice, when I'm running drills, you know, my third or fourth run, you oh, know, yeah. I'll start to get a swing or something <laughs> like that. So how do you how do you train yourself to uh, to perform right out of the box? There again, understanding what you need to see. If you if you can you can try to make it happen or you can watch it happen. If you try to make it happen, you're never going to be good. If you watch it happen, it's always going to be good. Trying to make anything happen takes you off of your off of your state of where you are at the moment. You once you've hung an expectation on a performance, you're dead. You are absolute dead. Like you know, you turn around, hey guys, watch me burn this down. Uh, not usually. 
<laughs> yeah. Famous because, last words. Because your expectation won't allow you to take the time it takes to execute that shot. Because subconsciously, you're never going to shoot fast enough. But if you always shoot as fast as you can see, you're on your mark all the time. Because if you go back through your performances and you, and, you, uh, and you try to grade it, you can always come back to, you know, I didn't really call that shot. I never really stopped the gun. I didn't right. ever have a visual moment. I shot, I shot a blur. I came at the target. The gun never stopped. I never saw a front sight. I shot at a blur. I never saw the edges of the target. So you never saw anything. Then you can't repeat what you can't see. So one thing feeds off of the other, feeds off of the other. And once you stack a bunch of negatives in there, it's uh, always trying to expect something is, is, is a big boat anchor. That's what I, what I call running with the ball or running after the ball. Right. You know, once you have a few wins under your belt, you got that, hey, man, I'm the man. You know, I'm, I'm going to shoot this really fast. The anchor even gets bigger. So it takes more talent to overcome that anchor because once you hang an expectation on your performance, it was like I was to put a two-by-twelve on the floor, 10-foot long. Mm-hmm. Everybody and their brother could walk it. I put it up 10 feet. Oh, yeah. You put it up 100 feet. That's it. You put it up 1,000 feet. And the only thing different is an expectation of a performance. Now I put a skill level on it. I have to walk this thing. And you get real choppy. And your muscles are real jittery. It's the same thing when you shoot a match. You put an expectation of a performance because it has a value now. And once you assign a value to it, you're going to second guess every motion you make. And you get real choppy. And you counteract everything you see in with an expectation, I got to do this better. Instead of just walking a two by four, can't do it. You lock up. Same thing in a match. Wow. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally does. I mean, it, that's like the best way to, to put it because that's it like is. a context everyone yeah. can understand. Yeah. I can walk that plank, you put it up on it, you put it up and give it a value, and now you got your life on it. Pretty high value, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> but a lot of people put that much value on a competition. Instead of just relaxing and just seeing it and making it happen, they want to make it happen. And then you get that real choppy feeling. That's that expectation of a performance overriding your natural moment. Mm-hmm. And then you lose it. Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, it, Most it totally Most things is. in life are so easy, but it's so hard to do. The, yeah. guy, the guys who can mount a gun and, it, and it's shaking all over the place and they can still trigger a shot are those that can always do well. Yeah, but, and then there's that whole thing of, you know, you know the whole – <laughs> guys watch this type thing oh yeah so you get out there and it's like i'm gonna burn this stage what down. happened a testosterone clouds your vision yeah you know <laughs> oh, god it does <laughs> it's hard if that uh, yeah testosterone will make you very uh erratic yeah big so, guy big guy syndrome <laughs> been responsible for you know a bunch of bad decisions and most guys it's sunk, many, a long time. it's sunk many a battleship <laughs> that's, that's true <laughs> so so jerry what is uh so these days You've got this this uh, proficiency level. You've been shooting since 1976, right? Is that what you yep, said? Yeah. So what does your practice look like on like a day-to-day, week-to-week, or month-to-month basis? And and specifically, how do you get ready for a match like this at Rocky Mountain for young? This one is such an equipment-oriented event. you got to have perfect equipment. If you have any doubts, I'd rather have stuff that really didn't shoot all that well, but it went bang every time I pulled the trigger. If you don't have confidence in what you have in your hands, uh, it's never going to be good. So equipment has to be good. You want to have everything and access to what you need when you need it. Uh, you get up on the line, have all your stuff, have a checklist. You'd be surprised how many people don't have all their equipment on their belt when they get called to the line. We saw it today. Yeah. Right. It's happened many Young times. Young Mr. Yackley had to run you, back you for have to, his magazine. You have these small things. Like I, before I shoot, I'll do a, I'll do a dot check on all my guns. I'll physically touch everything on my belt. I'll look at the stage and I'll just go back through it mentally and try to walk it with my eyes closed so I know where every target is. So should I get a uh, a malfunction with the one of the one of the firearms, that when you look down and clear this malfunction, when you come up, you should know where you are. You don't want to be like that goose that I wake <laughs> up in a different world every morning. You don't want to have that event. So you should have you should be able to see every target. First thing I do on a stage, I walk it and I see every target. You've got to find every shot you're going to make. And you, after you walk it a few times, you should be able to go back, turn around, close your eyes and know where every target is and you should know where the distances are on the rifle shots if you don't you're leaving a whole lot of a lot of meat on the bone and that's an expectation of a performance and it's not going to be a performance so you can't have anything i always have extra ammunition 
I always have an extra magazine. I have an extra few speed loaders. So if you get into trouble, you need to drop a magazine, you only have another one. You don't want to be picking it off the ground. Yeah. Because once you break vision off the off the event, you're going to be like that goose. You're going to wake up in a new world, and then you're going to skip a target. You're going to run by a target. So last thing you want to do is dig the grave deeper than you can jump out of. <laughs> you ever heard that saying? I haven't, but I okay. like that. What it is, if you find yourself <laughs> on a stage, you have, you have a malfunction, you see a lot of guys kick the speed back up. Right. You already, you already, yeah. you already dug a grave, okay? You get, you're that much in a hole, and they they take off and they miss a bunch more targets, and the grave is so deep, nowhere in the, in, the, in the match can you jump out of it. You've got a hole you can't climb out of. So you have to expect that when you screw it up, keep it small. Even if it's big, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just happening. So just live with it, live with the moment, keep, keep grunting through it, finish it up strong. Just don't make it such a catastrophic failure that you can never overcome it in a match. So... You're going to drag that anchor through the whole match, but you never know. The other guy might be dragging one, too. You just, you just hadn't seen his hole, how deep it is. So uh, you just got to keep plugging along, keep yourself honest. You don't have to win every stage. Just have to stay constant. I like that. So, yep. Jerry, got just a couple minutes yep. here, and then we need to uh, break as I yep. hear some uh, stomachs rumbling. Yep. But uh, just tell me real quick about the uh, the best stage that you've had so far out of uh, two days two days of shooting. Well, probably the best one I had was this last one off the rooftop there. Uh, yesterday, I wasn't really feeling good. I think it was the altitude and what I was eating here. I had uh, my stomach was just on fire. And this morning, I felt a little better. Uh, I wish I had some salt tablets up here. Got a little bit. De- I don't. I wasn't dehydrated, but I don't think my I was on a good level. Uh, anyway, felt a little bit better after lunch. Started shooting good. The last stage was was pretty solid, so I I would say that was probably my best one yet. So I'm hoping tomorrow I'll smooth out a little bit more. So they're starting to pick up speed. I was real choppy on the first and just had no air in me at all. It was like I was in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're getting acclimated. So yeah, what? Uh, somewhat. Yeah. How how was that stage? I I know that you had to shoot from a rooftop and yeah. there were some distance targets, but can right. you describe it briefly for us? Well, you started off uh, with the shotgun. You had a slug target at about 80 yards. Then you transitioned into three steel targets. Then you ran up and shot a steel on the left and a steel on the right and ran up and shot three more steel targets on the right. Reloaded a stick of slugs, shot another bird shot on a, on a bird shot target, of course. Shot a slug target at about 60 yards. Transitioned over to two more slug targets at about 80 and 95 yards. Shot those two, transitioned back to three more bird shot targets. Finished up there, put the gun on safe, threw it in the drum, unstrapped your rifle off your back. Loaded a mag, shot two paper targets, got on the uh, the rooftop, which was backwards. It was a backwards rooftop. Right. Kind of did a, a, a rollover prone, shot a target at 230, 285, 255, 180, and 140. Shot three more paper on the run to a, to a spool, shot another paper, took the, took the bipod out, shot a target at 130, 180, uh, 200, 255, and, and, three, and 380, I think. Wow, it's quite so, the stage. Yeah, it was. So I, I remember it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's how you have to. That's how much you have to put into it. Uh, if you don't, they give you. What's really a luxury here is that you have a lot of time. You could come before the before the match and actually mm-hmm. walk the stages. If this was a world IPSC match, as a squad, you get three minutes. Can't take any notes. Wow. Can't write on your hand. Can't take any notes. And that's it. Three minutes. So if you got if you got ten guys on a squad. You got three minutes to look at each, you know, the whole stage. You don't have but a few seconds at each position. So the setups are so important. So this is like a luxury here. So I can write this stuff on my hands. I had notes all over. I still have them here. <laughs> so that, that one says eggs and milk, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's just fun. It's, you always shoot against yourself. You know, if you shoot against yourself, you always have a good match. You can't control the other guy anyway. That's that's great, you know. So, Jerry, one final question yep. for you: If you can leave the audience with just one thought or one piece of advice, what would it be? Have fun. Can't you know, say it any better than that, know, right? I've been doing this for well, since '76, so it still lights me up. I still enjoy doing it. You know, it gets me out of bed in the morning. Well, and you can definitely tell, like you know, everyone out there has probably seen one of your YouTube videos, and at the end, yeah. you know, you're you're <laughs> laughing, you're having a good time, and and it it definitely shows through. Beats working for a living. I did that for a while, and I didn't like it. <laughs> well, sweet. That's another good piece of advice. Well, Jerry, you know, thank you for your time, and, uh, you know, thanks for joining me on the 3 Gun Show. My pleasure.
Enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm going to hit. <laughs> Dude, there's something uh, you said the other day, like just as I press a record button, and I'm like, oh, that's going to be a sound bite. And you missed it? Yeah, it could have been a sound bite, but I missed the first word. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm good for those, though. Dude, everybody's good for those. It's it's kind of fun. If you have someone that's, that's like. That's why we need a button board. Yeah. I do need a button board. Put that in the suggestion box. I will. <laughs> you know, suggestions are real easy when you're not footing the bill for everything. Right? <laughs> you guys should have a shoot house. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> so when is your backhoe and carpentry squad going to get here? All right, buddy. What, what, Dave, what? I, I Go got to ask you a question. Yeah, what's up? Okay. So there are two headsets. Actually, there's four headsets. There are four headsets. There are four headsets. Each mm-hmm. one marked with a neon colored strip. Yes. Which one's your favorite? Green. Is it? Uh-huh. Why? Uh, because only I use green. And it, I don't have a weird germ thing. But, I knew it. <laughs> but only I use green. I was trying to decide. Like, if you, would, if you had your own headset, because it's like... I do this all the time. This one's mine. Yep, I do. Or if it's like, hey, you're my guest. Here, have my good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are not good ones and bad ones. They all work equal, equally well. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, green's my favorite color. And uh, and then I don't feel like after we... Um, you don't like rub the orange one with kryptonite or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, t- I'll tell you a little story about the pink one. But... <laughs> So the, uh, but the green one, I don't feel like I have to clean uh, sunscreen off of it. Like after I use it oh, for my guests, because it's mine. And yeah. then I also don't feel like I have to clean someone else's sunscreen off of it because it, it's mine, the one I use all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I did use the yellow one a lot of shot though. Um, but yeah, so the pink one, I like to give that to the, the most rowdy member of the crew, you know, if they need to be taken down a peg. <laughs> and... I just think it's like one of those <laughs> one of those things like if a kid has a headache when you're on a hike, you give them a rock and like rub the rock and it'll it'll take your headache away and it just gives them something to concentrate on other than their headache. Mm-hmm. So just like a sort of small little, you know, uh, cosmic vibration that will change their attitude. I don't know if it works or not, but I wish I wish I would have had a rock when I was running that jungle run stage. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So I was 14 years old following those shooters, but I was 75 when I was walking back to the front. <laughs> All I could think about was how bad my feet hurt. Oh yeah, they still do. I I've been camped out behind the behind the counter at work all week. I don't want to walk around. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a ton of miles to cover when you're our own for three days, shooting for two days, and then you know standing around in the evening at you know, talking to people and stuff like that. Yeah. I pretty much didn't sit down for five days because I was covering the uh, two-way heritage junior camp. Yeah. And then we did the uh, RO shoot and then I was standing around for the match taking video and stuff. I'm on my feet a lot for, for retail. So I'm, I'm used to it. I can stand, but man, I got our feet got all, we got all wet on Thursday, the day before Mm -hmm. the match. And then I had blisters on Friday, and once mm. once it started, it was downhill. Get that trench foot. It was downhill slide. Once we got the jump foot, yeah. <laughs> but all right, Adam. All right. So <clears throat> can you can you fig- first of all first before we get started, can you figure out why each of these headsets has the color on them? So I'm guessing it has something to do with the soundboard. It does. So you can. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it used to be. When I first started doing this, um, and I believe that was like three Gun Nation Nationals, 2015 is when I had three microphones. Mm-hmm. So if someone needed to be raised, I would have to look at them, follow their cord <laughs> back to <laughs> back to the board, and figure out uh, which one they were plugged in, right? And so then I was like, oh, you know what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and. Uh, there's four spots and they're kind of arranged in a square. I'll just make sure that when we're talking, then uh, they are at that position. And that made it a little easier, 
Mm -hmm. But what I did then was I just put a, uh, a colored strip on the ear pieces of the of the headset, mm -hmm. and then a colored strip on where on the uh, connector where it plugs into the recorder. Mm -hmm. And now I can easily see. Oh, orange is too quiet. Turn orange up. Oh. Yep. Smart like that. Pink just burped. Gotta, gotta shut him down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pink's getting a little rowdy. Unload show clear.